All right, good evening, everybody. How you doing? Yeah. Hey, Harold. All right, terrible. good, terrible. All right, somebody's honest out there. Um, all right, my name is Nick Palumbo. I'm the Neighborhood Association Outreach Coordinator for Open Savannah, and I'll be moderating the discussion tonight for Hack Savannah Resiliency and Response to give you an inside look at how our community has been working through not just one, but two major tropical systems over the last two years. Have any of you guys had a great idea of how you could improve your city? Come on, give me a round of applause. Have you? And, and that's right. That's why we're here. For participation. All, right. All right. Now, how many of you would like the chance to build that idea and work with community decision makers to make that happen and win some money while doing it? All right. Just a show of hands. How many of you folks are from Savannah, Chatham County, right here? Okay, how many from Georgia, outside of Savannah? Uh, who's the farthest away? Chicago. Anybody? New Chicago? York. Anybody? New York. New York? Columbia. 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 Wow, give them a round of applause. All right, thank you so much. All right, now the, uh, we're going to get on to the panel discussion. This is just going to be about one hour. We're going to talk candidly with all of you. We've got some experts in the field and our boots on the ground neighborhood association leadership here to talk with you today about what we experience in Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Matthew. Uh, let's get started. Uh, first up we have Scott Craig. If I, once I call you, if you could just wave out to everybody else. Uh, Scott Craig is the webmaster for Chatham County Government, a uh, position he's held both during Hurricanes Matthew and Irma. We have Jill Gamble. Jill serves as the community, Coastal Community Resilience Specialist for the Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant at University of Georgia. Dennis Jones. Dennis is the Director of Chatham Emergency Management Agency, the official emergency management agency for the coastal Georgia region. Thank you. Cam Mathis. Hey, Cam. Uh, Cam directs the IT department for the city of Savannah and plays a vocal role in selecting which government technology vendors the city hires. Chelsea Sawyer. Uh, Chelsea serves as SEMA's Community Outreach Lead, educating the public about disaster preparedness and training the agency's rescue aid and volunteer team. Travis Schuff. Hey, Travis is a Senior Systems Analyst for Chatham County, developed custom software systems to improve and automate government operations. Uh, and we have some Neighborhood Association leadership as well, the boots on the ground. First, I'd like to introduce you to Rob Hessler, co-chair of the Parkside Neighborhood Association. Uh, Gretchen Hilmer, social media coordinator and public relations extraordinaire for Parkside Neighborhood. And Michelle Stevens, who serves on the board of directors for this neighborhood right here, Thomas Square. All right, now let's get into it. Um, because we've got such a large panel here today, we're gonna follow a little different format than the go down the line and give you the microphone approach. Um, Usually by the time we get to the end, everyone just kind of repeats themselves. So what we're going to do, I'm going to ask a question, and we're going to give a toss-up, and if you just kind of raise your hand, I'll pass the microphone to you. All right. Let's see. All right, well, let's talk about communications during the storms. How were communications handled during Matthew and Irma? What were some of the lessons that you guys learned, and what do you think we still have to learn yet from communications? Uh, so, as social media coordinator for Parkside, when Matthew came, we actually had to fully establish our open chat, which when Irma came, we were pretty solid in our open chat. So, when the storm hit with Matthew, we were able to coordinate from the people who stayed to go and check on properties and make sure everyone was okay. But the next one, we actually kind of got ahead of things and I tried to find out whoever was staying in town what strengths they had, so if someone could do medical, if anybody got into trouble, um, if anyone could make food, or anyone who was helping clean up crews, if anyone needed help cleaning up, or there was problems with their property, who could come out. So being able to use social media to be able to connect people and kind of structure relief effort was extremely helpful. We didn't actually need it, thank goodness, but you never know when the next Okay, uh, so I'm Chelsea Sawyer. I work as the outreach coordinator for SEMA, so this is a question I feel like is kind of, kind of mine. Um, so I started three weeks before Hurricane Matthew. 
so I really had no idea what I was getting myself into. Uh, but I sat at the EOC and had to function all of our social media campaigns, work with our public information officer to send information out to the media. Uh, I ran our Chatham County or Chatham Emergency Management Agency website. Um, and I tried to do all of this in a very short amount of time. Um, every update that came, uh, we were trying to push out more and more information, developing infographics for people uh, to be able to understand and see. Uh, as you probably know, sending something out on Twitter with just words is not the most effective way to get your message out. And I learned that about halfway through the storm. Um, so I'd say during Matthew, we had uh, some communication challenges, making sure we were getting the information out there in a timely manner and effective because I didn't quite understand my role yet. Um, I will say that during Hurricane Irma, uh, we were very successful. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with Scott Craig. Um, he kind of transitioned under the Emergency Management Agency during times of disaster, and we were able to send things out very quickly. Uh, we had a, a nice board of everything that was supposed to go out, the time that it was supposed to go out, and I think that our messaging was consistent and effective. Okay. I'm going to get my work out today. Um, tell me a little bit about fake news, uh, especially in anticipation for a storm. I remember the rumor going out beforehand that if you were evacuating, that a hotel must take all of your pets, which was later debunked. Uh, tell me about your guys' experience with a little bit of the fake news and how do you quell some of that in the event Um, I talk a lot of people, talk to a lot of people in the neighborhood, in coffee shops, asking them if they were going, if they were staying. So it's not as much about on fa uh, Facebook or whatever, but when it comes to fake news, as far as like people who are evacuating and finding out um, how it important it was to evacuate or what the emergency was, I actually rely a lot on and credit due to SEMA or whoever decided to do a lot of live streams on Facebook of what was going on with the evacuation this time for Irma because not everyone was looking at the live stream, but I thought that was actually really good to debunk some of the fake news about what, what was the urgency of evacuation and all the different uh, updates. So I would say if you were not getting that live stream, then it would be good that you had a neighbor or someone in the community that was telling you what the uh, information coming from SEMA was. Right, and, and to add to what she said, you know, social media really is a double-edged sword for us. You know, we Chelsea did a great job this year. She was the one that started the infographics this year, which really helped debunk some of the rumors. But, you know, social media is a double-edged sword. While you all are the people that are out there and, you know, can help us spread some awesome information, you, you guys sometimes don't know where to go for it. And so I think that that's, you know, something we have to work on uh, as a community, as, as community leaders, um, to be able to allow you guys to share that stuff because you are our voice out there, but to direct you guys to the proper information. Um, you know, whether it be the city, whether it be the county, you know, during a time of emergency, I mean, SEMA is the de facto standard, but you know, even during non-times of emergency where we're trying to get community information, how do we approach that? How do we tell the fake news um, and get you guys the information you guys really need to have? Yeah, I just want to say one thing in regards to that is that um, what we heard from it in our neighborhood was um, as a evacuation order was premature and people made that judgment as the storm got smaller and smaller as it was approaching Savannah so what happened was is that people thought well okay the people in charge don't know what they're talking about so they were less inclined to listen to the information that was being presented out to the um, to the community from organizations that ordinarily would be trusted 
So one thing that I would say from a community standpoint, from um, as a neighborhood association, is that people are inclined to listen to what we have to say. So if we can receive information directly from the organizations and then it's kind of filtered through us, we're sort of a trusted source and they know us personally. So coming from us, it sounds like, okay, this is legitimate information. But coming from the governor out there who doesn't really know what's going on in Savannah, it can, I think it can come off a little bit less trustworthy. And I think because of that, when situations like this happen where, where, where people do perceive that the, um, the evacuation order is a little bit premature, that the next time that it comes around, people are less inclined to listen to that information and believe that it's, it's worth listening to and, and following, so. Um, I think kind of getting back to what Scott was saying too, uh, there is something uh, available which is a virtual operations support team um, or a VOST. And that's something that we're actively trying to develop in Chatham County. And the idea of a VOST is to have people outside of the emergency operations center, maybe even people outside of Savannah at this point, that have those internal connections within Chatham County. So it could be the neighborhood associations, it could be the buy, sell, trade Savannah, um, but finding rumors as they happen. Um, so one of the biggest problems that Scott and I found during Irma, during Matthew, is that we didn't hear these rumors until far after the rumors had already died down. And um, so after the fact, we found out that apparently SEMA was handing out checks when you came back into the county. Um, <laughs> that is absolutely false, but there's a lot of people that really thought that they were going to get a check for $2,000 from Dennis Jones when they came back into the county. Um, we can't put a stop to those rumors unless we know that they're happening. Uh, so maybe that's a way that you guys could go this weekend is, is helping us identify a way to find those rumors that, that people are talking about in coffee shops or that people are talking about on social media. So I don't know if this is really on this topic or not. This is not my um, area of expertise, but you, I, I think we just do need to remember that in you know, the science of predicting storms and hurricanes is not exact. So when things move and um, we all watch the weather 24-7, we were paying attention to that cone of interest, and we all watched it drift to the west. Uh, even though it drifted to the west and looked like our coastline was out of the cone, we still had some significant damage. The storm was huge, and, and none of us really know that. So I really caution folks um, who choose to stay behind. And it's an inconvenience, I fully understand that, but really, uh, we just don't know what's gonna happen. And again, I work for the city in helping support internal services, so supporting public safety. Those resources are really tapped, and they have a lot of work to do. And going to um, rescue folks who just chose to stay, who then find themselves in a really bad way, is just very frustrating for everybody. I want to talk a little bit about the decision of whether or not to evacuate. Uh, just a show of hands, if you could tell me if you evacuated for Hurricane Matthew, please raise your hand. If you evacuated for Irma, please raise your hand. Okay. How many chose one but not the other? Did anybody do one but not the other? Uh, tell me a little bit about the reasoning behind your decision and how can technology empower you to make the right choice? Well, so we talked a little bit about this in the green room. There was a, um, uh, there's a local weatherman, um, and I mean, I kind of think of him as a genius, this guy Chuck Watson, who operates um, Anki Research. And so he, is oper he was operating a, basically a weather station from in our neighborhood. So he was kind of one block over and two blocks up. And so he was very, very close, and he's got antennas on, his, on the top of his house and everything like that. And so we kind of felt, um, and again, this kind of goes back to a, we were trusting the person who lived in our neighborhood, who we knew personally, that we felt would give us the best information, that when he said it was time to worry, then we felt like then it was time to worry. And so, um, while I, you know, I, uh, as what was just said, when, while to a certain extent I'm inclined to 
Gretchen and I are the kind of people that are inclined to listen to what SEMA has to say. I don't necessarily know that everybody is as logical in making their decisions as maybe Gretchen and I are. So again, having a local resource like that where we felt, where, where, and a lot of people in our neighborhood were really following Chuck and what he had to say. I know, Chuck's in Japan right now because he's dealing with a storm out there. But there is, um, I think that, that having a resource that you know, that we knew, that definitely impacted. So we, it, we were willing to, to evacuate, but we were also more like, well, let's wait and see a little bit. Just because the, govern, the governor called for an evacuation, we were like, well, Chuck is saying it's not something necessarily to start panicking about now, so we're going to wait. And we did wait, and then we felt in the long run that that ended up being the best decision for us. So, well, I'm, but I'd like to put uh, Dennis on the spot and just tell us what's some of the reasoning behind ordering an evacuation order and, and some of the uh, facts that go behind those decisions. Well, all of our decision making is predicated on the arrival of tropical storm force winds. Now, there's a lot of fans of Chuck Watson in here. If you're a fan of Chuck Watson, raise your hand. Chuck Watson's a great guy. But listen to him, listening to him solely in your evacuation decision is irresponsible. All right? You're not going to sue Chuck Watson. You're going to sue the Chatham County. Or you're going to sue the National Weather Service. So our decision making is predicated on the arrival of tropical storm force winds. Our evacuation clearance time is 36 hours. It takes 36 hours for us to clear out Chatham County for a major storm. So that's what our decision making is predicated on. It's predicated on your safety. I think there's a very fine line between overestimating and underestimating because I know Matthew, the decision came kind of late and that was a criticism we all received last year. Well, it felt late to a lot of citizens. I'm just repeating what I've heard. Um, and this year, it was five days ahead of the storm. How many days ahead was it? So, but it was Thursday when the order started coming through, and when you were talking about evacuating. And then the storm didn't hit until Tuesday morning. Well, what was the call for the evacuation? The decision was made on Thursday. Right, so that's five days, right? See, I think that's, it's, and, and, Let's make it really clear that as a neighborhood, we're not attacking what SEMA did. It's just that people make decisions based on how they feel, not based on the facts of the situation. So even though you might have a very strong and accurate factual argument, if people believe that you're being premature or believe that you're being late, that's what really matters when it comes to people making a decision about whether or not they will stay or go. All right, the decision making, making for Matthew and Irma, it was all done at the same time. But up here, we've got people who believe Matthew was too late and Irma was too early. So again, as, uh, as, uh, as was mentioned up here on the panel, it's a double-edged sword. The timing was exactly the same for both storms. Well, we're gonna talk about a little bit about, I mean, every evacuation order is an intensely personal decision. I mean, I think we all agree in that, you know, um, that each person chooses for their own. But I really want to get on to how, uh, specifically, how are we using data systems to generate better, better and more informed responses? And Travis, tell me a little bit about your work in automating some of these systems and how they've improved them, and how can we do even more? Topic just or expand on that topic to get another conversation that we started in the in the um, green room. Um, the city and the county share a tool for um, 
alerting, uh, sending uh, telephone alerts or text alerts if people sign up to receive them. Um, this is a system called SwiftReach, and again, we share this contract and share the use of that. Um, so I think I, I would love some discussion on how we can better use that tool, or um, if I can bring up the topic, um, and Chelsea, if you can follow up about um, getting the word out for folks to register who have special needs or may have some medical needs so that they can get some attention uh, to help with evacuation. And again, the, the concern or the, the point we need to hammer home is people can sign up for that year round. We don't want them to wait until, oh, the storm is now down barely upon us. That's a little too late to register for that. So that maybe there's some tools we can leverage. You want to talk about that for a minute? So what Kim is referencing is the Functional Access and Medical Needs Registry through the Department of Public Health. And this is a registry that allows people that have um, functional medical needs and need uh, assistance. They need assistance evacuating. They need assistance when they evacuate. So they can't go to a general shelter. Uh, those are people that are on dialysis or that uh, use a wheelchair or that have some sort of medical condition, functional condition that kind of prevents them from evacuating with the general population. Um, we have about, uh, do you know? We have 143 people that are currently registered here in Chatham County. Um, but we think that perhaps that number is low um, in, in comparison to the amount of functional access and medical needs people that we have in the county. Um, and this is something that's been going on for over 10 years, um, and we've, we are constantly trying to advertise this. We've been on news stations, we've created public service announcements. I go out into the community day in and day out um, and stress this through um, our promotional materials. And I think that people just don't understand the urgency with this. Um, they'll try to call last minute. Um, so during Matthew and then again during Irma, we had a lot of people calling um, up until right before the storm, the tropical, tropical storm force winds were going to hit, saying, uh, I'm in New York and my mom's in Savannah and I want to know what I can do to help her. Um, and that puts us in a really difficult place um, because technically at that point when tropical storm force winds happen, we're not supposed to send ambulances out. We're not supposed to have those emergency responders um, out in the field. Uh, so that, that's the registry that Cam is, is mentioning. To kind of bring it back around, just as you guys are thinking of ideas and stuff like that, to, to bring it back to Nick's original question and kind of tying what Cam and, and Chelsea had said, there's really three sections of things we need to worry about. Number one is before the hurricane. Like Cam was saying, we were talking about in the, in the green room, there's only about 143 people registered, and the people that we're trying to register were registering one to two days before the hurricane. We can't handle that volume. You know, we can't handle that a couple of days before. So we have the preparation we need to deal with. While it seems counterintuitive, there's kind of a lull during the event. I mean, we definitely are very, very active as a government during the event. There's less things we can interact with the citizens. During the event, citizens should be out or in their homes. But then there's also the disaster recovery. So as you guys are thinking, Automation can happen in any three of those sections. Um, and to bring it back to what we were talking about before with evacuation, um, so I'm at University of Georgia. Um, after Hurricane Matthew, we did research here in Chatham County um, in Savannah on why people evacuated, why they didn't. And some of the things that we found, um, I think there are um, opportunities to follow up and um, opportunities to, to develop some things. So here are some of the things that um, I'm remembering off the top of my head. Uh, one was concern about pets, um, elderly family members or dependent family members and not having a plan to take care of them or to somewhere to go with them, uh, waiting until it's too late to make a plan, um, not understanding the forecast, um, and then right along with this is not hearing about the storm, so not being connected with their neighbors or having family members to really explain. Because as you know, the forecast changes really quickly, and um, if they don't have someone to kind of keep them up to date on that, then um, they may wait until it's too late to leave. Um, 
and i think the the biggest one that we heard oh i'm sorry and then another one was wanting to immediately check on their property so that as you know if you have damage to your home and you're not there it the damage could increase if it continues to rain let's say the roof is um torn off or damaged that then rain comes inside and can cause mold and people were concerned about um what that would happen if they weren't there to immediately tarp it and address it so something that could um, connect people to be able to check on their home remotely um you know might be an idea jill tell me a little bit about uh sea level rise our position along the coast what kind of risk does that carry and maybe for the rest of you what does a direct hit on savannah look like Well, I will let Chelsea, she was just talking about <laughs> doing storm surge analysis, but I can tell you that here in Savannah, we have a NOAA tide gauge at Fort Pulaski National Monument, not too far from here. It's been um, collecting uh, measurements um, since 1935, and since that time, it's um, measured 10-inch rise in sea level. Um, so that's not anything, you know, that's, that's observational, um, just recorded change. So um, Savannah, parts of Savannah are, are very vulnerable, specifically um, the barrier islands and, and some of the low-lying areas. Sure, so for storm surge specifically, uh, that is a huge concern here in Chatham County. Uh, during Hurricane Matthew, we did experience the worst flooding that we've had. That's uh, measured at Fort Pulaski at 12.56 feet. Um, hurricane, or tropical storm Irma, uh, had very, very close to that record that Matthew set in 2016 with 12.24 feet. Um, so not too far behind it. Um, so a lot of people thinking, wow, Hurricane Matthew, Tropical Storm Irma, they weren't that bad. Let's think about this for a second. The worst flooding that we've seen since we've been measuring in 1939. Uh, so let that sink in for just a little bit. Also, Talk about storm surge. Um, storm surge is the astronomical tide um, kind of rising along with um, the, the winds and, and the rain that come with a, a tropical storm or a hurricane. Uh, so it depends a lot on the size, the size of the storm, the intensity of the storm, what the winds look like with that storm. A very fast moving storm, not gonna have a lot of storm surge uh, because you know, the, the rain is not gonna have a, a lot of time to kind of sink in and, and cause that storm surge. But if you have a large, slow-moving storm on top of these high tides, just similar to what we might have seen um, during Irma, as these high tides coming in, this slow storm with a lot of rain, you're gonna see, you're gonna see flooding like what you saw in Tybee, what you saw in parts of the city of Savannah, and what you saw on Wilmington and Whitmarsh Islands. Um, now I will say, if we have a direct category three storm here in Chatham County, most of Chatham County is gonna be underwater. And that's something that not a lot of people realize. A lot of people think, oh, I'm not in a flood zone, I'm gonna be fine. According to what we've, and, and this is not just SEMA coming up with these numbers, SEMA coming up with these flood maps. This is National Weather Service, this is NOAA, um, people that do this full-time people outside of Savannah, people in Savannah that are putting these maps together saying that a Category 3 storm, most of Chatham County is going to be underwater. And just want to make sure that you all understand the connection between sea level rise and storm surge is that if, you know, if you're starting from this base and you have a storm that's bringing like a five-foot storm surge on top of the normal tide, Okay, so it's gonna be like to here. If you have a foot of sea level rise, then you're starting from here. And so you're, it's sort of like giving steroids to the storm surge, right? And so if we're talking about potentially six feet of sea level rise, that means the storm surge, the starting point is, you know, up here. And then we're gonna have like a Hurricane Matthew or a Hurricane Irma on top of that. Uh, just one question in particular for storm surge. So we've talked a lot about evacuation. I'm asking this for myself. But so if the sea levels are rising and my house is about to go, is there a secondary emergency alert system uh, that, that is the, oh my God, panic button for the people of Chatham County, for those that stuck around, or is the evacuation order, that's it?
the sea level rise is going to take place over a period of years. All right, it's not going to happen next year. Um, with our evacuation clearance times, we redo those clearance times every five years. So we take that into account, sea level rise, we take into account the demographics and transportation networks, et cetera. So is there a backup to, to staying? Is that what you're asking? Let's say if somebody stayed and there is a massive storm surge that is going to flood all of Chatham County, I mean, is there a, I don't know, what do you do then? Uh, that's it. You pray. pray. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know, one reason Chelsea alluded, or she stated that our storm surge is, uh, is pretty bad with a Category 3, and one of the reasons why is because we have the Savannah River on the north side and we have the Aguicha River on the south side. And as soon as storm surge starts coming into the county, it pushes all of that seawater up into those, into those river banks and it actually starts uh, flooding the county in a U-shape, essentially. And then once it gets to the low-lying areas or low spots back on the western edge of the county, now it starts creating islands within the city of Savannah and other municipalities. So you essentially get cut off. You get cut off from the mainland uh, with even a Category 3 storm. And Chelsea had mentioned that most of our county is underwater. Uh, about 75% of our county would have some type of storm surge encroachment with a Category 3 storm. With a Category 4 or 5 storm, we're talking 95 to 97% of our county. The only two areas in our county that will actually um, are outside of the Cat 5 flood zone is the Savannah Airport, portions of the Savannah Airport, and then also downtown Savannah going out to Hunter. It's actually a little ridge that runs from Bay Street all the way out to Hunter. So uh, you're essentially creating islands. So when we issue evacuation orders, it's because of the statistics of the storm and, uh, and also to get you away from that storm surge potential. So if, uh, if you decided to stay, um, chances are you're not gonna have any services. You're not gonna have any resources available to you. If you fall down the stairs and you break a leg, there's nobody that's gonna be able to get to you. Um, it's not that they don't want to come, they may not even be able to get to you at all. So we don't encourage people to stay, obviously. Uh, we want people to get out, and we want them to get out safely. Uh, I will say, though, um, if you're, to answer your direct question of what notifications will go out, the National Weather Service does have an emergency alert system. Um, so the same type of thing that you'll get on your phone, if there's an, if there's an amber alert, if there's a missing child, um, that same where everybody's in a room and your phones start blowing up. Um, that will happen for storm surge inundation, uh, for storm surge warnings. But at that point, when a storm surge warning is issued on your phone, you're already in trouble. Um, so when that goes off, it's more like a, hey, you're in a really bad situation. <laughs> you probably should have thought about that. Um, you're already in a bad place. Um, so I strongly encourage you to heed our warnings, listen to what we have to say. We're not calling for evacuation orders for our health, and um, we're doing it for yours. Uh, looking at this from a program point of view, I think being the social media coordinator, as soon as SEMA released information, I and I always put their information first and foremost, I didn't share anybody else's info, um, I made sure everybody got it directly immediately told anybody I could. So an application that could send alerts directly to the phone, but also sync up with the emergency alert system and possibly provide up to the date storm surge maps would be very useful because then people can have a visual idea of what's coming at them. Thank you, that's an outstanding suggestion. Uh, Coming back after each of these storms, whether you're coming back into town or, or going through them, is quite an, an emotional experience. I was wondering if somebody would be willing to share with me a heartwarming story of either storm that they experienced. Any volunteer? Okay, um, well, for my neighborhood, Thomas Square neighborhood, I actually stayed for both of them. And one of the first things that happened after each storm is people on on my block, we started picking up the smaller branches. Um, we also walked around the neighborhood, like a de facto neighborhood storm watch to see if there was any significant damage because there were people who left town um, and took photos. And if anyone, if our neighbors needed them, we can give them to them so for, for filing like insurance claims or whatever. 
So I think one of the things that you can do, even if your house isn't damaged, to find out what's going on in your neighborhood, um, especially after Matthew, there were a lot of trees down. So. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I've realized uh, with a lot of homeowners insurance, and a lot of people don't know this, but they do provide a lot of coverage, such as uh, food spoilage, uh, even uh, hotel reimbursements for evacuations. It all really depends on the policy. But a lot of people don't know this. They don't really uh, read the fine print of the contract they sign, but really having a, a, a checklist of, I'm coming back. What do I need to do? And one of them should be checking with your insurance policies. For a heartwarming story for coming back into the city, uh, I think it was very emotional for a lot of us coming in, but for the people who stayed, they immediately banded together, I mean, at least in Parkside and some other places outside of Parkside, um, to help each other, to go through food before it spoiled. And there was a really big sense of community, and I think that really helped bring people together. So being able to just be in touch with the community, be in touch with the people you live with, basically, was really nice. Um, I'd like to add to that too, um, after Irma, we were able to set up a volunteer reception center. Um, we actually had two, one in the city of Savannah and one on Tybee Island. Um, something for you all to consider as well. Uh, we utilize a system called crisiscleanup.org. I don't know if you guys are at all familiar with that, um, but it allows people to call a 1-800 number and it inputs all of their information um, if they need volunteer assistance cleaning up. So um, let's say they don't have a great neighborhood association that they can kind of call on. Um, this is a way for Miss Jones down the street to help clear out all the furniture from her flooded home um, or help pick up the tree branches outside of her home. Um, one of the problems we ran into with our volunteer reception center is matching these cases that we have to the floods of volunteers that were coming in. Um, so being able to say we have a group of volunteers from Compassion Christian Church and matching them with Mrs. Jones. Um, so a way to develop that would be really helpful too. One thing that I thought was really cool that happened in a lot of the, um, the open chats for Parkside, I saw it on the Artsy Park open chat as well, is that um, these uh, sort of postings started coming up of like what's open. Like where is there, what restaurants are open, what gas stations are open, where can you get ice, where can you get cash, where can you charge your, your phone, where you can get, where can you take a shower. It was like the list would start and it would just go all the way down and as the day, the hours and days went on, it would, it would be updated, hours when places were open, whether they had food or not or whatever and um, I just thought that was a really cool way. Everybody was kind of communicating and then you'd go to those places and everybody would be there. Um, and kind of sharing their stories and experiences of being in the storm, so. There has to be a backside to this question. I asked for a heartwarming experiences, so I was hoping one of you could share with me a heartbreaking experience if you had some from these storms. Um, so I did interviews after Hurricane Matthew, um, and I think one of the takeaways I had is I had um, preconceived notions of who would be vulnerable, who would be the ones that would be really affected, and um, the interviews totally broke that open. It was actually one of the people that um, you know just was crying in the interview was a woman who lived on Tybee Island, fairly wealthy, but her home was really damaged. And when I interviewed her six months on, she was still out of her home and just the stress of dealing with insurance and the disruption to her life, um, you know, the emotional toll that that had taken. Whereas, you know, I think I had stereotypes in my head of who, who is vulnerable to these events. Um, and, you know, it's partially based on location and partially luck, I don't know, and access to resources. Um, I think it's, a comp it's much more complex, I think, than I realized. few uh, that I could tell and I might I might do that if no one else has some. Um, one story uh, really comes to mind is actually my hairdresser. Um, her name is JC Davis and um, right before Hurricane Matthew, um, for some reason, her and her husband decided to kind of split, um, not get a divorce, but to split and not make a decision to evacuate together. 
Um, JC took her two kids and she evacuated and her husband, who is an Afghanistan war vet, um, decided he was going to stay at home. Um, he was worried that looters were going to come into their home um, and take some of the things that they had. It was a huge concern of his. Um, halfway through the night, about two or, two or three o'clock in the morning, um, a tree collapsed on top of their bedroom um, and it completely smashed him. Um, JC came back. Um, she wasn't able to get in contact with her husband. Um, eventually someone let her know um, that something had happened and that she needed to come home. Um, she has two small children under the age of five um, that she now has to raise on her own. Um, and that's a huge heartbreaking story. Um, someone that thought that, you know, his words to his wife beforehand were, I made it through a war. A hurricane doesn't scare me. Um, but we don't have control over weather. And you never know when something like flood waters coming in or a tree falling down is going to take your life, um, which is why we do what we do. Um, another one that really broke my heart, um, I was going around after Matthew looking at a lot of the damage and, and working with the Georgia Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster to set up a long-term recovery task force, um, which helps take care of people like what um, we had talked about up here, people whose insurance don't cover, um, or they, they didn't have adequate coverage on their insurance, or maybe they didn't have homeowner's insurance. Um, I took a look at all of the, the mold that had grown in her home. Um, she had a giant hole in her roof, and water just came flooding in during Matthew. Um, this was several months later, so Matthew happened in October. This was in January and she had not been able to do anything. She was 75 years old, living by herself, with black mold riddled in her home. Um, so that's another heartbreaking story. We were able to help her rebuild her home, um, get all of the mold out, um, and that's through work that we've had with our long-term recovery task force. So happy ending, but still horribly hard to see. Just so everyone knows too, thank you. Uh, just could you give me a raise of your hand if you're gonna be a judge on Sunday. Uh, a lot of the folks up here are gonna be judging, also judging the competition. So I'd like to give you guys an opportunity to ask questions. We might have time for about three, um, three or four, and then we're gonna wrap this up. I want you to think of your technology wish list of if you could dream up anything to empower the citizens of Chatham County, uh, you know, shoot the works, but please, if anybody would like to ask a question from the field. All right, come on up. All right, introduce yourself. Hey, Robbie Gondolia here, um, engineer at Globeshire. Had a few questions. Um, first of all, great job explaining to me. I didn't know this side of how the government handles disaster management. One of the things I was always wondering about as we move on to 21st century, you have these giant companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, that has these giant databases. Basically, they know everything about our life. How does government, in such scenarios, when it comes to disaster, is there any way where we collaborate with them, uh, ask them questions, um, and use some of their database to help people evacuate in a more uh, seamless manner Thank you. Thank you. I can answer from the research community. I mean, for government, it's probably a different answer, but this is a very hot topic in the research community and um, one that's just starting to be explored. So there's a lot of opportunity, um, but it hasn't really been tested yet. And um, yeah, but good idea. And I don't know if y'all are using that in your. I agree with Jill, I mean, this is, um, that'd be very cutting edge, so you guys can help us figure out how possibly we could do that. Again, I think, you know, we rely, I mentioned before, this um, tool called Swift Reach, um, which is a way for us to send information out, but it requires that the citizen take the first step to register to say that they want to be notified, and then there's a list of topics you can be notified about. Um, so, so again, the answer is, is no. It'd be interesting to, to learn more about it. Um, we, and we're waiting for the residents to really take the first step to tell us how they want us to contact them. Well, 
what is the current process right now for access to resources after a storm? What does a citizen have to go through? How do they get to them? Like if I've been impacted by the storm, I need to get in touch with public and private resources and relief efforts. How, how do I go about doing that? Um, how do people find out about the, uh, the services that are provided? Um, that's a huge part of community outreach. It's getting out and talking with the media. It's getting out and putting things on our website, getting things out on social media, um, and also making sure that people know where the right place to call. Um, so that's, that's a big piece of it, too. So uh, a lot of people are calling um, 911 because they need help getting something off of their their home, um, but that's not a 911 problem. That's probably a crisis cleanup problem, um, or trying to figure out how to um, how to get debris removed from their yard. They're calling FEMA. And that's not really a FEMA problem. That's more of a public works problem. Um, so the biggest thing is just. Uh, putting stuff out on social media, sharing it with our neighborhood associations, going out and speaking in public forums. Um, and FEMA also does a really good job. So the last two disasters, we've been very fortunate, uh, or not, um, to have individual assistance declared through FEMA, um, which means that FEMA will bring in a horde of people um, that will go out and do their own damage assessment. They'll go out and see what the damages are um, they have their own public information officers to help spread that information. And we also set up things uh, called disaster recovery centers. We still have one open here in Chatham County after Irma, um, which is at the Southwest Chatham Library. Um, that's a, a wealth of knowledge. Um, when people walk in, they meet with someone from FEMA, get an idea of how to register and what that needs to look like, and if they qualify, if they don't. Um, making sure that they don't walk away empty-handed, that they they have some sort of a resource before they leave. An application with a searchable database, so tree removal, uh, reporting power outages, how to contact um, trash removal, anything that could be a resource. If you could just make a searchable database, that would be amazing. Um, you know, we're talking a lot about private citizens, but another um, aspect of storms is how small businesses are impacted. Um, so there are recovery centers where small businesses can go and get um, loans, but you, know, you think about these events and you know, if you're a restaurant or a, a hotel, you, know, you may be out of um, you know, profit for a, a month. Um, and so you know, that's another area where there's a lot of risk. And or, um, you know, again, saying, being a way, to, a way to share resources. So I'm a small business and I have just restocked my inventory in my refrigerator. I've got a lot of food that I can share or with, or with another small business. How can that information be shared back and forth? I was just gonna say, as far as you guys are working on the hack this weekend, is to kind of see about like some kind of, actually more of like if then statements and decision trees post the storm because it seems that to me from this conversation that is a lot more automated more so than what what people will do pre a storm because what people do pre a storm is get all the information and make a decision more likely based on what they feel is best for them personally and may may not be as much about um, storm surge or fats or SEMA, but what happens post the storm, all of that stuff is actual research data that you can actually do something with. So I would say maybe that might be something that people might want to spend a lot more time on. Thank you. Do we have another question from anybody? Come on up. Hi, oh. thanks for being here. Um, my question is in relation to um, SEMA. Um, I don't think um, you've expanded on it uh, much um, in terms of how do you guys allocate resources to, um, to the community before a storm hits or before any emergency? Um, is there a system that you use in terms of the technical team? Is there a system that you use or is there um, a process that you go through? You might like expanding on it. Uh, 
how do we allocate resources prior to a storm? Most of our response activities are coordinated in the public safety sector, which is police, fire, and EMS. Those are the traditional responders. Uh, but we also have non-traditional responders like public works and IT personnel. So uh, we have a hurricane response timeline that we follow that starts at 120 hours from impact. And we work through that hurricane response timeline, uh, going through checking the box, making sure that we're coordinating all of the assets. Uh, SEAM is only uh, a certain amount of people. We don't have the assets. We're coordinators. So we work with the city of Savannah and the city of Port Wentworth and Chatham County government and, uh, and also state and federal partners in order to get those assets locally. So uh, what we do is, is we try and find the resource locally. We try and allocate those resources with local, uh, local vendors. If we can't do that, then we send the state uh, a request for assistance. They try and find it throughout the state. If they can't find it, then it goes to the federal government. So every disaster is a local disaster. It starts at the local level. So again, we try and find all those resources and assets locally. And sometimes it can be a challenge because you've got people that are trying to evacuate, obviously. So what you may can count on during a tornado, you don't necessarily, uh, you're not able to count on them during a hurricane. So it does get challenging at times. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Not really, kind of, sort of. Allocation of resources. Yeah, it's more like, do you, um, how do you decide what neighborhoods to concentrate on or what, um, what areas to get that? Because, like you mentioned, the, the limited amount of resources, human resources. Right. right, post disaster? How do we concentrate on post neighborhoods? Disaster. Yeah, there's several programs that we work that's, uh, it's pre-disaster programs like hazard mitigation, disaster hazard mitigation. There's also a vulnerability matrix that, uh, that we work with as far as damage assessments go. So we look at what are the vulnerable populations regarding survivability of the storm, and we pre-identify what assets we may need to go in and do damage assessments for that particular sector. Same thing with uh, commodities. We have what we call a pod plan or a point of distribution. And we have those set up at key locations or we have identified key locations throughout Chatham County where we could set up a pod so that it would be a cluster of the community. So most of them are set up at schools. Everybody knows where the schools are in their communities. So uh, most of the time we'd have, uh, during a major event, we'd have a pod or a point of distribution set up at one of those cluster sites. So people can come and get ice and water and feminine hygiene products and, you know, like a wash kit and stuff like that. So um, we do have uh, assets that we can pre-stage um, with the state. They'll have them stage outside the county and they'll send them straight to those distribution points. I think one thing that would be really interesting um, is that, so I know this on a neighborhood level, is that people will say, okay, so there's a disaster, happens. And then you'll be at your house, and three blocks over, you see people working on that block. And you're wondering, well, why are they not over here on my block, and why aren't they doing anything? And so, basically, what happens at a neighborhood level is everybody starts talking about how, well, they suck, and they're not doing anything for us, and they're doing something for the neighbor, and why is that? And I think that would be really interesting is if there was some way where that information could be communicated to the neighbors, to neighborhoods as to why these things are happening, what's the timeline for when certain things can be expected as far as like, you know, this neighborhood versus that neighborhood, how it all interacts because, you know, you guys are experts and professionals in this, but most people are just like me and we just live in the neighborhood and we're just trying to, you know, figure out, well, what's happening? We want to know what's happening and I think that, um, you know, Savannah's kind of a small town, so you can often sign see, like you can literally see somebody getting their house worked on across the street, and then three days will go by before they come over to your house, and it's like, well, what, what happened there? That's a real good point. Uh, you know what he just mentioned? The, the information's there. It's just not in a place where they could normally get it. Um, a lot of the things that were mentioned up here on the panel, the information is there. Finding some way to take all this information and compile it into, into one or two resources where it's easy for the public to get to 
easy for them to understand. I think that could be a huge success. Yes, please. As a recipient of Power Envy, I, would, I had power two days before. My name was across the street. I can tell you that uh, knowing where and when things are happening is really important, and I, I really love that idea of one, a one-stop shop and finding all this information. We've got about just two minutes left for one more question out of the audience for, for a, a really good one. Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll take Carl. Uh, I'd like to introduce you guys to our uh, brigade captain of Open Savannah, Ms. Carl Lewis, and uh, just gonna put him on the spot. Sorry, I'm a little hoarse today. Um, I just want to, I don't want to bring up, uh, you know, I don't want to bring up any you know, sorts of blame for anyone for any sorts of evaluation efforts again. But I guess I had this question going through my mind. Is it possible to be, to evacuate too early? Because in, I understand it's very important to be prepared in advance. It's very important to take every step that we can to be as safe as we can. At the same time, in this particular instance with Irma, which is probably not a, a total anomaly, we had a lot of people who were leaving this area to go to Macon and Atlanta where it was actually worse. The storm charge, of course, wasn't, but the wind was. And a lot of, it, there was flooding there somewhat, too. Um, and also they were taking in valuable hotel rooms and shelter space that people in Florida really, really, really desperately needed. Um, so I guess that's my question, is, is there such a thing as too soon? And I, and I say that with respect to you know, the importance of being cautious and the importance of, you know, being as prepared as possible. Too soon? Is there such a possibility? Yeah, everything's possible. Um, you know, if, if we evacuated the county five days ahead of time, that's too soon. If we did it four days ahead of time, that's too soon. Uh, you know, 36 hours is based on, on uh, behavioral studies that were done by professional contractors. It's based on uh, FEMA experts and Corps of Engineer experts as well as local experts. So the decision making as far as the clearance time goes uh, is scalable. With a smaller storm, the clearance time is, is less, obviously. Um, so yet there is a possibility that you could, you could jump the gun and evacuate too early. Absolutely, there's always that possibility. Um, with our evacuation clearance times, however, again, it's based on sound statistical data and also behavioral studies from the community. Now, that study was uh, conducted four years ago, so it's up for renewal, and uh, we'll certainly work with the Corps on doing that. It's probably gonna expand beyond 36 hours, just because our demographics have changed. Um, okay, let me think of how to say this. But, so Irma, right, came up the west coast of Florida, came more, I mean, I think it was more than 100 miles from the Georgia coast and was a tropical storm at that point. And so I think people here really perceive that, like, whew, you know, the risk was minimal. Um, if you look at a storm surge map of, of the southeast, our area actually along the Georgia coast had the highest amount of storm surge, even though it was a tropical storm, on, you know, in Georgia. It was really far from here but the shape of our coast causes water to really pile up. And so I think that risk is very hard to communicate to people that even if there's a storm that's not close by, we're very vulnerable here um, to flooding. And um, yeah, so I mean, I think that that also factors into evacuation decisions. It's not just the, the path of the hurricane, which everyone focuses on, right, when we all watch the Weather Channel, but it's also these other dynamics. really adding to this, uh, and that something that's really overlooked is a majority of the deaths from a storm like this is from the storm surge. It's not the wind. It is not from debris. It is really the storm surge itself coming up causing water damage, making uh, people inaccessible to emergency services. So the decision to evacuate inland is not to escape the wind, it's to escape the rising water. A lot of people have this misconception that the error cone that you see, um, that everybody has plastered everywhere when a storm is approaching, that's not how big the storm is. Um, not even close to that, actually. 
how the National Hurricane Center bases that cone off the last five years and how accurate they were. Um, so that's where the eye of the storm could go. Um, that will not tell you how big or how small the storm is. Um, so just want to make sure that's very clear. Well, we had a lot of problems with that, um, with people commenting on SEMA's um, social media sites saying, well, why are you worried about it? It's not even going to hit us. Well, as we saw, it's not true. Um, but again, that's just where the eye's going. Uh, that's not the entire width of the storm. If you just go down the line and tell me about your technology wish list, if you guys have any other final thoughts, and we'll, we'll round them home and, and this will wrap this up right now. Well, uh, the idea of one-stop shop, um, taking all the information that's already out there, and there's things out there that we don't even know about. Um, so if there's any kind of, of method that could be utilized to identify uh, you know, sources of information that could be beneficial, um, you know, and then bringing that all to a site or an application or something that would make it easy for the general public to, to go and get, as I said, one-stop shop. Yeah, I have to agree. That would make my job a lot easier to be able to post it to one place um, and for people to be able to understand it. It's, got, it's, it's very frustrating uh, for me to constantly push out information and then to have someone say, oh, I've never even heard of that before, uh, when I've been spending so much time um, trying to get information out there. So something that people will utilize and something that's easy for, for all types of people to understand, those that aren't, those that don't like cell phones, those that still have landlines, those that um, love social media, and those that hate it. So something that can kind of meet everybody where they are. Uh, an app that could from SEMA, up-to-date storm maps for the surge where the eye could land and the exact expanse of the storm would be helpful. Uh, something that I think would be fantastic is just a resource map. So someplace uh, where people could go get their phones charged, have food, any medical attention, any assistance with debris removal, any gas stations that are open. Uh, I know Nextdoor has an option where you can just keep it to your neighborhood. So if there's a possibility of just being able to have an inner neighborhood connection, that would be fantastic. Um, yeah. I think that for me, the biggest concern in the neighbor, uh, as far as the neighborhood thing goes, is sort of um, maybe problematic for a for an app or or a program, and that's that there are many. We have no, many elderly residents that are actually not connected to these kind of things, and getting information to them is what our main concern is because I actually think that they're in the most danger when it comes to something like this. And so we do our best to try to reach out to these people, but it can be really difficult um, at times. And so uh, we were having a discussion back in the green room before this about how um, you know we're inclined to get that information, but um, somehow, and I don't know how this would work, but I think you can kind of extrapolate in a, to a certain extent the people who are not receiving the information by seeing who is receiving the information. And I think that that would be kind of, a, um, if we could somehow figure out a way that we can reach those people that aren't inclined to necessarily engage with that, I think that would be great. I, I really think it's worth noting that uh, post-disaster communication may not be available as well as power. So definitely having an offline option uh, to these resources as well. I mean. Communication comes up sporadically. I remember with Matthew, uh, I was in uh, Rinkin. Uh, the only cell phone tower was located near the Kroger, and everybody within the area was there, and you were lucky to be able to make a phone call, uh, which was really difficult trying to uh, work at the same time, but uh, being able to mitigate communication problems is extremely important in these post-disaster events. I think I was going to actually say what Chelsea and Dennis said, but uh, you know, one of the other things we can focus on too is, like I've said before, you guys are, as citizens, one of the best sources of information. The problem is sometimes that information is wrong. So being able to use machine learning and uh, an algorithm to be able to sift out that information and get it back to us as community leaders, get it back to you guys as citizens, would be a great addition to, to be able to make, allow us to make our, our decisions and you guys to be able to make your decisions as well. Okay, I've got a few ideas. Um, 
building off what everyone was talking about with an app or a resource, um, you know, I think there are things like power outage maps, um, county websites, there are storm surge maps. Um, Charleston National Weather Service um, issues regular bulletins, so links to that. Um, during a storm, uh, people you know who are evacuated, they're not, um, they may be where they're not seeing coastal news because they're like in Atlanta, and so having a way of, of getting um, on the ground information. Um, where to go with pets, having a way to, and that may already exist, I don't know, but um, does it? does like re hotels um community centers churches that are opening the doors and, and um allowing pets so, and then your idea of the small business resource connection i think is awesome so we're at a disadvantage michelle to be at the end of the <laughs> have to come up with something new um i would just suggest also um maybe a way to help uh for citizens to post information with pictures about damage assessment because uh, that's where we spend a lot of resources at the city and the county sending staff out as soon as the storm is over we can get out to try to see um, in, in the extent of the damage and the other thing that i've learned these last two years is and y'all can help me out I mean, between gema at the state level and fema at the federal level for them to declare um, disaster needs or disaster assistance is based on information that's fed to them about you know dollar amounts of damage and so we need that information Okay. Um, I was thinking of a couple of things. One, um, to maybe address people who are elderly or who are not as um, app enabled, is if we can figure out who in the neighborhood has landlines and, and then reach out to those people because they're, they're less likely to be on the internet if they have a landline. It's probably a real strong correlation with that. And then, <laughs> and then another thing is, I, I use Nextdoor, but I think when it comes down to when you're like, have problems with internet, you probably, we need to probably maybe start relying more on text alerts. And maybe if there was some kind of way, you can have a neighborhood text alert. And then if you want to get off of it, you can just text off, because probably everyone will be texting what's going on but you can opt in and opt out to a text alert in your neighborhood what's going on. All right, well thank you so much. Uh, please, let's give our panelists a round of applause.